Hi, I'm Ajal, and I'm Strategic and Product Partnerships Manager at Stitch. I feel very privileged to be sharing the stage with everyone here. Um, before we get into introductions from the panel, I just want to maybe ask everybody here, I mean, we hear open banking, we see it in the news, we hear about it everywhere, um, and it, it is a little bit of a buzzword, you know, open banking, open finance. But I just want to maybe ask you, when you think about open banking, um, what is a key word that comes to mind? If you can just put up your hand and, you know, just give a keyword and then sees where I'm making him do some exercise here, he'll come around and just ask you, what is the keyword that comes to mind? Show of hands. Take your time. <laughs> First person to put their hand up is right at the back. <laughs> okay, so when you think about open banking, what comes to mind? Uh, my account and my account, any bank. Your account, any bank. Anyone else? Open banking. When you think about open banking, so what do you think about? Innovation. Innovation. Okay, on this side of the table, let's see, guys. Open banking. When we think about open banking, Grant, what do you think about? Simplicity. Nice, we've got simplicity. Let's do one more. Open banking. What do we think about when we think about open banking? Everything I can do in my bank, I can do it anywhere else. Okay, cool. Joel, happy? Cool. Do you remember all four? More or less, cool. Take it away. Okay, thanks. That was just to get everybody thinking about open banking, what it means to you. And I mean, I think that the, those were the core words. It is innovation, it's simplistic, it's accessibility. Um, those are my thoughts on it, but I think we can now move into the introductions. Um, and I think if the panelists could just maybe state their name, what they do, and also a key word from your end on what does open banking mean to you? And I feel like we should start with Bonolo. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I've been having a few conversations with people, and the question I keep getting asked is, how long have I been in the bank? Um, 10 years. And it's funny, when I joined the bank, I used to say, like, explicitly, I'm a creative who just happens to work for a bank. Uh, these days, I say I'm a banker. So um, I am responsible for strategic and operational execution um, for the payments SA um, team. Um, looking at you know delivery around what the, the rails that we deliver against as well as uh, engagements from a regulatory and interbank perspective. My interpretation of open banking um, is around enablement. So it's about how do we enable third parties to be able to process payments um, for their customers, you know, in terms of the, the user, uh, the value proposition they're driving. And I think further to that, when you think about open finance, that is a little bit broader in terms of how do we create an environment where we are then able to allow access to financial data you know, and be able to participate um, as a wider ecosystem to be able to then service customers. So winner would be the customer in terms of how we, we deal with that. And there's a couple of stuff that I think we're still all considering on how to, to make that work. I think we can move on to Colin. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, Colin Monovec, product manager for PayShop. Um, we said we're not gonna talk about PayShop, only Debbie check today, so. No questions. <laughs> no, but jokes aside, um, I sort of took my career, started my career in vehicle finance, um, dabbled a bit in, in card payments, e-commerce, masterpass, etc. cetera, um, then jumped into corporate payments with fintechs, etc. and then um, dabbled a bit in the e-commerce space trying to build a fintech in, in a bank. Guys, not a good idea, don't do it. Um, too much governance and compliance. Um, and then um, moved over into Banks of Africa to launch um, PayShop. Um, so on the open banking side, I think the, the easiest way for me to explain it is giving accessibility to um, anyone out there to financial information and data. And if you think about open finance, open finance is, is the products that come after that, for example, insurance, um, investments, etc. So if open banking is a chapter, open finance is the rest of the book. Jerome. 
Hi everyone, uh, Jerome Passable. I lead the Capitec Pay team. I um, was responsible for the open banking journey uh, within, within Capitec. Um, about five years ago, if you asked any bank, open banking, you would have been kicked out of the boardroom. Uh, and that was because it was the analogy of kind of handing over the keys to the vault. And I think a lot has happened in the industry over the last five years. And I think the realization that what open banking can do, uh, certainly for South Africa as a country, I think has become a reality. Open banking um, has been seen primarily as a push from the bank to become more open and implying there that it opens up what existing in the bank is closed APIs between different services and, and areas of the bank to make the, making these open uh, these APIs open. And in open banking, they traditionally emanated two pillars, which is share account information, and then give the ability for a third party to initiate a payment request. Open finance is like the wrapper around open banking. And it broadens, as, the, as it's been already mentioned, it broadens the use cases of, of open banking with one fundamental shift. It's a case of being of reciprocal participation. And that introduces in itself more obligations of those who participate in open finance. Um, banks, obviously, as financial institutions are regulated by the Financial Services Conduct Authority third-party payment providers and fintechs or not. So that is a whole big debate as to how do we create an environment where there is safety and security and trust and no rogue uh, actors in that system. Thanks, Jerome. And now my fellow Stitch, Louis. Yes, hi, all Louis here. So I look after product partnerships and I didn't, we didn't do the seating deliberately this way. So um, in partnerships, our focus is really on working together and, and solving problems together. Uh, so my background comes from a few years in investment banking, a few years in consulting, and then spent about four and a half years in crypto, where we really needed the help of everybody around us to, to make things work. And now making it full circle back into payments and more traditional finance. So when I think about open banking and open fi finance, I think about efficiency for businesses and for people. So ultimately, a lot of these benefits will go to the individuals, you and I, people who don't necessarily have access to insurance products, lending products. So having information accessible with the right guardrails in one place, giving people access to their own information, being able to initiate or authorize transactions more easily and more efficiently is really, I think, just so much benefit for everybody around, everybody in the ecosystem. Thanks, Louis. Um, and I think, Jerome, you encapsulated it quite nicely in that open banking, it is fairly new, it's relatively new, and I don't think just in South Africa, I think globally, it's a fairly new concept, open banking, open finance. But I think specifically in South Africa, it has been adopted quite nicely, and we have seen great advancements on it, you know, um, with Capitec Pay and with the word on everybody's mind or that's been in panel discussions, PayShap. Um, so maybe we can move into a question for you, Colin. Maybe if you could just go into a bit about PayShap, um, how it originated, you know, what, what was the need that PayShap was trying to solve? Yeah, so look, I think the, the most important thing was, is, uh, you know, the main use case for us is to try and displace about 10% of the cash currently in the market. So we've heard a lot about everyone mentioning PayShop displacing cash. That is not possible. I don't think um, it will ever happen. Cash is king for a reason. And there's nothing that's easier to clear and settle than cash today. But it's how do we digitize that process? Uh, how, and that was where PayShop was born. How do we create that interoperability and accessibility? And not only the tech savvy people, but also people that um, have feature phones and USSD, et cetera. And I think the biggest word is financial inclusion. Now, that is not a buzzword for us. That is our mission. That is our purpose. And the, we, we're pushing as hard as we can to strive and achieve that um, in the very near future, but we can't do it on our own. 
We need every single person in this room um, to talk about PayShop as much as we can, get people to start using it, getting the adoption right, because it is a real benefit if we can get this right. I like that you use the word interoperability, and I know that we did chat a bit about it before as well. I mean, that's basically the purpose of the national payment system. And I think a big thing for PayShop that's made it quite interoperable is the tech that it's built on. Um, I mean, we've seen it in the news, it will, in the media, that it's built on ISO 20022. Um, but I think for many people, like I can say specifically with me, what exactly does that mean? What does ISO, like we see it's this new ISO technology, but what exactly does that mean? Yeah, so I think uh, I can hear there's a lot of card knowledge in the room. So um, card is built on ISO 8583 where PayShop is built on um, a distributed ledger technology where you can be more agile, um, you know, accelerate when it comes to growth and innovation. And then also the architecture of ISO 2022. Now, ISO 2020, uh, 2022 is a, is a global financial standard, um, just with the messaging, so it just helps with the, um, the messaging um, that gets pushed um, and standardizing that messaging. And what that helps us is make sure that we not only solving and innovating domestically, but we can also do it regionally and internationally. Um, a lot of our existing products that we, we have in um, Banks of Africa, for example, TCIB, which is our scheme for cross-border payments and um, corridor payments, and also um, DebitCheck is also built on ISO 2022. So we're already starting to see how do we create that conversion between the, the rails, how do we benefit from it, because PayShop is a network effect. And I think that's very critical to understand because if we can get the adoption right internally, we can get that cross-border pay payments happening um, regionally and also vice versa. Thanks. Um, so you mentioned the adoption, Bonolo. I know you've been quite involved in the PayShop offering at Standard Bank. Um, I just wanted to get from your perspective, how has adoption of PayShop been? Um, and are there anything... Anything exciting that we can expect to come? So before I speak to adoption, I think we need to take it a step back and just kind of remember um, the importance of PayShop in terms of it being a catalyst to the Saab's vision 2025. You know, we've got to think about, it was mentioned, financial inclusion being quite an important thing, interoperability, and for it to be the bedrock of um, innovation and, you know, encouraging more competition happening um, in, in, in South Africa. And I think it's also important to kind of reflect back on um, the role that that is playing in the way that we are, that, that the way that, we, that, that we're operating. The volumes, I think, have been significant. So if you look at it from March 2025, holistically, we have almost, I think, up to 2.6 uh, look, 2.6 yeah, million transactions since March um, on, on, on this platform. And I think that's fantastic in terms of the period that, that PayShop has been, has been here. Um, and I think from a, from a Standard Bank specific um, view, we have been looking at how do we leverage what we've built, which is a pay by proxy, specifically in our business as well as our corporate um, uh, use cases to see how we can enable that. And we're also dabbling around in terms of how we can start looking at small scale QR um, enablement. I do think though a lot of the critical focus in terms of where we are should then remain in stability of the platform as well as making sure that from a fraud perspective we are doing what we need to do to make sure that this is a success story for South Africa. Thanks. Yeah, and I think just the important metric to mention as well. So the, the stats that, mentioned, that was mentioned just now. So on Women's Day was a great day for, for us in Pesha. Um, we, we made our first million transactions, the first milestone for us. But in that month as well, we then also did 700,000 transactions, almost achieving a million transactions in one month. And this month already, we almost, you know, we, we're nudging and touching a million transactions. So that's the positive on the transaction side. But the most exciting part is the, the proxy enlistment. Um, where we're sitting over 1.5 million proxies enlisted today. Proxies, shop ID, I hate saying proxy, but um, your shop ID, your mobile number, um, with your ad sign at your, at your bank. And what we've seen translate, and I mean, that's eight, it, it was 700,000 in the beginning of the month. We're sitting on 1.5 million, so 800,000 proxies enlisted. So I know there's a lot of comments around, oh yeah, proxy has failed and, and PayShop is a failure because of proxy not doing what it's supposed to. But 
I always say to people, you know, account payments has been around for over 20, 30 years, 50 years, I know EFT. And, and I mean, that's one, one equals N, right? And for proxy, it's zero to one. So we just need to give it time through education and use cases and, and the, these forums, you know, not talking about it, but actually doing the work and helping people understand and educate it. Because one of the other metrics that we also track is to see unique customers, how many unique customers we're seeing, but also how many repeat customers we're seeing. And then also how do we me measure that from a one, two, four, six, eight, up until 10 plus. And we can see 60% of the, the customers are sitting between four and seven transactions on a monthly basis. So we're seeing repeat usage, if you want to call it that, um, in the pay shop environment. Thanks, Colin. Um, so right now I know that there is proxy to pay. Um, and in especially panel one discussion, there was mention of request to pay, and there's a lot of eagerness on when these things are going to be coming out. Do you mind just taking us through maybe what the next 12 to 18 months look like in terms of progress with PayShap, anything that we can expect in the development space of PayShap? Yeah, look, it's an exciting space. So just to reflect where we are today. So we've launched with P2P, person to person and person to merchant. Just to be clear for the card people in the room, um, merchant being defined as a, as a service provider or a, a single pass merchant. Um, and also, we've also um, launched our, our FATF16 requirements uh, directed from the Saab and also some of our farm um, score injections that we've also now started to, to build in. And we're starting to see that starting to work. We've had two cases of fraud, confirmed fraud, one being a disgruntled customer. Um, might be my wife. <laughs> Friendly I, didn't, fraud. I, I, haven't, I haven't received my rugby jersey yet, so um, I might, there might be a third one. But in any case, so it was uh, one, one transaction confirmed as fraud, 4,000 Rand. Um, but that is sort of where we are today. Now, the next release, um, uh, PR2, is Request to Pay, which we're releasing next year. Um, which is a big drive and a big focus for us at the moment. Um, I think Request to Pay is going to be the real core fun or the fundamental thing that we need in this market to help us accelerate it. Now, for most of the retailers here and, and um, all the people that work in card, I mean, it's a four-party model. Um, if you think about it to make it logically, I mean, you go, you've got your bag of goods, you initiate a Request to Pay, you've got your POS terminal, you then present it to the customer. I choose how I want to pay, my store of value. I then accept that this is the amount I want to pay, and I push the payment. And that is how simple it sh should be. It shouldn't be complex. It shouldn't be overbearing. And also, how do we incorporate, I think Mo mentioned as well, that EMV co standard for QR. We need to provide the customers with the, with the options on how they want to pay and take away the complexity of payments that we know and understand um, from, from the consumer. So that's sort of where we are today and what we're focusing on the next six months. And then in the next 12 to 18 months is I think the big focus for us at the moment is bill and bulk payments, um, getting that over the line because I think it's a quick win and it's, a, it's an easy win, which will also then unlock government payments as well. And then I think the most complex one is then because that opens up B2B as well. So that's, that's almost killing three birds with one stone sort of scenario. And then I think the biggest one that everyone is probably waiting for me to, to mention is the B2M. Uh, person to, uh, uh, sorry, P2B, person to business, which is the retailer, the e-commerce person, the, the person with more than two devices, et cetera, which is extremely complex. Now, the position that we are in as the operator and the scheme, wearing multiple hats, is that we don't only look at the core of the national payment system, but we also need to now consider the, con the customer, the consumer at the end. So it's extremely important, and it was also mentioned by um, someone earlier as well, where we need to focus on the full value chain. Because us as the operator, we don't know what happens in the retail environment. I mean, just a few scenarios. If you think about a, a C store and a forecourt, you know, you need to consider fields like uh, liters, cost per liter, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, at, a, at a restaurant, if we want to all sit at the table and split the bill, you know, how do you split the bill with all of us and also then add a tip? those fields that need to be incorporated. So MCC codes that you have today in card, how do you reuse that? And, and also, the, how do you tokenize your shop ID? I mean, there's nothing easier today than tap and pay. How do you get that sort of where you can put your shop ID in one of the wallets today and you can open up your wallet, you've got your shop ID, you authenticate, and you pay? Payments should be made simple. And I think if we can stay to that concept as our true north, 
we will, we will win this battle, we'll win this fight. But then also last comment as well is that we've got a major responsibility, not just us as the operator and Banks of Africa uh, with PayShop, but all of us to make sure that this is a success. Because what it will mean for, our, um, for South Africa and our economy in the future, this is the platform for us to accelerate and modernize going forward. That's very true. And I think that what will, and we have mentioned it before, but it's all the banks being involved. That is what's going to make it a success. Um, and I like what you said about making payments quite simplistic, and that's very important. Um, people want simplicity, people want convenience. Um, and I know I'm going to come to you now, Mr. Capitec Pay, Jerome. Um, I know Capitec also just started recently offering PayShap. Um, and in, in addition to PayShap, you have Capitec Pay, which is built on an open API. I want to know from your perspective, what is the difference between Capitec Pay and PayShap? Because um, Capitec is offering both. Uh, so yeah, why, why have you decided to offer both payment methods? Um, I think to start off, if you think about um, the origins of, of Capitec Pay, it, it came out of solving a very specific client problem. So, I mean, after COVID, we realized that everybody had to do a lot of online shopping. And it wasn't necessarily uh, inclusive enough for everybody to access uh, and get services. And so the only alternatives there were if you had a card um, or if you used instant EFT. Card's expensive for a merchant. Uh, it's not the, not the most cost-effective way of acquiring a transaction. Sorry, uh, MasterCard. Um, and then, obviously, there's the instant EFT. And the problem with instant EFT, uh, which I think all the banks have held a position about it, is that it introduces systemic risk into the payment system because it requires a banking client to divulge their username and password, which you could argue... Um, puts them at risk. Um, they're firstly contravening their own banking agreement. Um, but it's not so much about the fact that the fintechs who provided the screen scraping technology, it's not that they were insecure or they were introducing fraud in their systems. It's about the fact that they were coaching consumers that it's okay to share your username and password. And that actually in itself means that the ownership or the onus to be able to discern, am I on a legitimate site, can I do this, rest with the consumer? And we felt that that wasn't fair. It wasn't fair to put that responsibility on the consumer to discern, am I actually doing this in a dodgy site or not? Other banks have taken a different approach and the way we approached it was to look at how could open banking solve a problem here. That brings inclusivity of fintechs and third parties into a, into a network that allows them to still participate, but making payments more safe and secure. So that was the, the rationale behind it. Um, so I guess that's one uh, business case or use case of open banking. It does drive innovation, but it's obviously very dependent on, willing, on the willingness of all parties to, to go with that. Since we launched Capitec Pay, so we officially launched it on the 6th of February, um, we've got distinct clients who have used Capitec Pay 18 times since the launch, about 3.5 million clients have using it actively. We are processing about 12.5 million transactions a month. The most important thing that we've learned in introducing a new payment method is two things. The first thing is your conversion rate. I mean, what that counts for a merchant. And the analogy I always say is if you imagine an online store and you've got 10 Capitec customers who walk into your store, we want nine of them to walk out as paying. That's kind of the mental mindset that we have. So we're close to 90% on our conversion rate. And if you think about, again, this is not necessarily validated information, but where screen scraping was on Capitec clients a year ago was between 45 and 60%. So there's a lot more benefit, downstream benefit, in, in that innovation around open banking. So why, why PayShap? At the end of the day, we're all serving the same objective. We all want to move from cash to electronic payments. 
And so we can't, you know, Capitec Pay is a closed loop system. It's for Capitec clients, uh, and it's not interoperable. So it's for a Capitec client, although it's significant in terms of the footfall that we bring into a, merchant, a merchant's environment. But we need to solve the problem as, in, as an industry and as a collective. So PayShap serves our purpose as a bank. We want to remove cash out of the system. Uh, we know that it's not convenient. We know that it's risky. Um, the perception of cash is it's, is it's free, but it's not. If you really think about the value chain of, hand, of handling cash. So PayShap becomes a universal lever for us to work with. We are super excited about the next phase, the request to pay. Uh, we are actively participating in that. We are giving our um, thinking around what we've done with Capitec Pay, and we are giving it into the industry to digest and see how we can align on that. At the end of the day, it serves us to have a payment rail that is interoperable. And we will be at the first in the line to be able to offer an interoperable payment initiation API. Thanks, Jerome. Yeah, I think interoperability is the word for the day. Um, Bonolo, maybe I can bring you in here as well. Do you see the other, do you see other banks following suit with open APIs or any other type of um, innovative open banking products? So on that one, I think product managers and marketing managers out there would shoot me if I had to share what their plans are in terms of what they're coming up with. But um, I do think what they are thinking about is, is, is stuff that we need to consider. So if you just take a step back in terms of Europe and you think about the Payment Service Directive 2, um, and I think that was 2015, um, and the learnings that we had around there, you know, so you have to think about the fact that they were given two years, so I think by 2018, everybody needed to have um, implemented it. Um, and there's been a lot of learnings in terms of fraud and what's happened around there, and also the unlevel playing field that, that that created. So I think from a South Africa perspective, what is exciting me on the journey and the process that we're taking and what some of these product managers are considering is around the work that the industry is doing in terms of the payment industry bodies or the PIB on creating the right kind of conduct um, framework so that our customers are protected and that we're really thinking about how do we ensure that the, 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 the environment works well for them. You've also got to think about the work that the FSCA is doing around the open pay, um, finance paper uh, that's currently in circulation. And that then allows us to kind of bash out amongst ourselves in an open environment you know, open environment in terms of wider than just the banks, in terms of how do we do this and how do we do it in a way that still we're protecting the customers. And personally, very happy with case studies like Capitec Pay because that then gives us, you know, very practical examples of how we actually think about this and, and, and in terms of um, being able to solve for it. And I think lastly, we've also got to think about um, competing priorities with limited budgets. Um, and I think supporting the work that we've done from a patient perspective and looking at, you know, request to pay, that could be the solution and that could be the way to drive the right kind of volume in the right kind of platform. So I think those are some of the things that product owners are, are considering, making sure that we keep customer sacrosanct in terms of trust, because that's some of the stuff from banking environment that we um, hold quite dear. Our brand, you know, so we, we, we think about our logo, we think about our brand, and we know that customers, when they see our brand, we need to know that they trust that we have taken care of all those terms and conditions that they never read and just tick, you know. So those are things I think that we are currently, um, or product managers and bankers are currently thinking about on how do we either follow suit or caveat um, to the request to pay journey in responding to the APR requests. And I think just to jump onto the bandwagon there, I think the reason why interoperability is the power word of the day is because of the power it has. I mean, at the center, we, we're fortunate because we can see what, it, what actually happens when you enable more and more participants with that interoperability because you get more people to play with. And that's what accelerated and helped the growth of PayShop because there's different commercial models. People are educating more. CapiPay helps and support what, you know, what a shop ID, or not a shop ID, but a proxy is. 
So it's all that education. And I think we, we've got a running joke uh, in, in Banks of Africa and PayShop is to, you know, a use case. If you can, the Google can say, Gajima Mfana, you know, and you can go and fetch it without sending him with any cash. And they can put in a proxy and you can then just accept and pay. You know, it, it's these things that we need to, we need to bring it up and we need to talk about these things because these are real use cases that we need to solve for. And, and the only way we can do it is through constant education and constant challenging. I think there was another comment. We need to be brave. We need to challenge one another and say, this is not the right way, the right way to do it. Um, there's a better way to do it. What you're doing is, is sending us down the wrong path. And I think it's, once again, it comes back to the responsibility of doing the right thing for not only for payments as a whole, but for our economy. Thanks, Colin. Yeah, I think when also thinking about interoperability and open banking, um, it's not just the banks involved. Fintechs are involved in a big way as well in making sure that everything works. Um, there was a paper done by McKenzie called Fintech in Africa, and I know that they indicated the value that fintechs, play, uh, fintechs add in you know, making financial products more cost-effective and more accessible. Um, so, Louis, I think this is a good time to bring you in. Um, what role do you think fintechs have played in the adoption of digital payment services in South Africa? So, I think what's, what's important to, to think about when bringing, looking at fintechs as another player in the ecosystem or the value chain that we've mentioned a few times today is everybody is trying to solve a problem. So. And, and you want to be solving the problems that you're going to be the best at and that you're going to be able to do sustainably from a cost perspective. So we, we all know that globally people are under pressure, money is, money is tight, margins are tight, We're try, everyone's trying to survive and run sustainable businesses. We want people, businesses to be focusing on their core products and their core value propositions. And, and what the fintechs are doing very well is, and we spoke about instant EFT a little, a little while back as well, is with cards, for example, very, very commonly used, very widely used in e-commerce, but also not in the most cost-effective solution for merchants, and because it is really expensive, is finding a way, okay, we, not everybody has a credit card, but let's find a way to solve this for businesses and make e-commerce accessible to more people. So that's where that product came out, so Instant EFT a while back, and, and, and it actually served that purpose for a while, and then we spoke about um, security and open APIs and driving that innovation forward. So I think that's from, an, from innovating and solving problems, that's what's really driving the industry, the whole industry forward, is the banks looking at this as well and saying, hang on, we've got to do something about this. We, we have an opportunity here. We can work with the banks. We can solve these problems together. So creating that better, better solution for everybody. Then in terms of actually offering that broader range of payment methods. It's really tough for businesses to, to do that themselves. So we spoke about ISO 2022. We spoke about, um, we talk about digital wallets like Apple Pay, Samsung Pay, Google Pay. These things are complex to integrate and complex to manage. And it's not like you just integrate it once and you carry on and you're, and you're finished. These things are changing and these APIs are changing regularly because We've got to keep security and customer safety at the forefront and scalability. So managing that, managing that basket of payment methods for other businesses is also really, really important and a really great way to enable more access to the consumers ultimately. And then we look at, talk about distribution. So we talk about um, Capitec Pay, for example, for, for payment service providers, teach fees who have, or fintechs who have very like significant relationships with multiple merchants already for them to add that product and distribute it to these merchants is a very efficient way of expanding the use of capitech pay and in addition to just distributing a product like capitech pay if you're enabling white labeling for example with your payment methods you're immediately creating that that sense of trust with the consumer and with just with launching capitech pay we immediately saw a huge uptick in adoption of just the capitech the bank initiated payment method on our platform. So really, really important on that side. And then you don't even, then you even go back to the administrative side of things. So now the merchant actually still needs to reconcile everything. So we actually need to see, we, we need to know where our transactions are at, what are the statuses, where's the money? And that's also a lot of work across multiple payment methods, even across multiple currencies. And being able to solve that is also creating a much more scalable solution for businesses. And again, ultimately making it easier to serve these products or offer these, these products to consumers. 
Thanks, Louis. And you've touched on this, um, on the importance of you know, partnerships and collaboration. But how would you say, you know, banks, regulators, fintechs, how is everybody working together um, to enhance financial operations within the country? I think to, to start with that, to start as an answer, it's really important that we do work together. And I think that's where sometimes we, we, we can get into a situation where it's saying it's um, these there are negative intentions on the one side or we're just trying to keep customers safe. But I think everybody has the same intention of solving, solving a set of problems and create, making it better for everyone and making it cost effective for everyone. So things like the Intergovernmental FinTech Working Group that was quite recently formed, that's been a really exciting development for me is because we're seeing that people are actually trying, we're, we're getting into sandboxes, we're running pilot programs. And I think making those open to innovative companies, companies who have the, the scale and the ability to disrupt and change quickly and develop quickly, I think is going to be really important while working together to keep customer safety at the top of mind. And I think then just as well, working with the open banking APIs, working really closely with the banks and building relationships with the banks. We, we've had sessions where we're talking and thinking deeply about customer conversion as well. And just why is, why is, where is this going on? Why is this going wrong? How do we get it up to 90% and beyond? Um, and then also just trying to solve or address the systemic cash problem that we're looking at. So coming up with unique products, being able to shop online without a card pay or an online payment method, then walking into store and settling that transaction. I think those things are really, really important. And that involves partnerships with with the fintechs involved with the banks, regulators have to understand it, and then also the, the retailer or the actual ultimate merchant has to be able to manage that. So I think keep working together with that and being, being willing to experiment and explore has been really, really important. And, and we have seen a lot of that. Yeah, just to echo that, I think the success of Capitec Pay has largely been through our partnership model. So we've got um, about 28 partners, FinTechs, Digital P's that are integrated on the API. And what they do is that they, they bring their access, the distribution access to, of Capitec Pay to, to the merchant base and able to fulfill their role as a, as a Digital P, all the functions that Louis has just, just mentioned. Um, if we decided to do it a different way, make it anybody wants to integrate, I would, wouldn't even be on the stage today. Um, so I think that's part of what makes open banking and open finance work, is it's, you've got to have a partnership mentality and work, the, work within our ecosystem and understand the contribution that everybody makes, because we all, correctly so, have the same objectives. We want to make payments convenient, we want to bring down the cost of acquiring a transaction, we want to, we want to build the economy, all these things are shared purposes that we want to drive. I think the, the other thing that the partnership mentality does is it helps you understand what are the future opportunities and use cases. I mean, we are now really at the point now of introducing variable recurring payments on Capitec Pay. Now that's, again, new for us and new for the industry. That's going to be an alternative to car-based uh, uh, subscription payments, an alternative to, to debit orders, but it's going to help grow the economy. It's going to help uh, merchants who have got an aspiration to get into a, a subscription-based model or extend their business into that to acquire those kind of transactions. Um, yeah, and I think that's just an, another good example. I also think that we are on the, the, uh, another kind of tsunami in open banking, which is going to come in, in the form of uh, customer data. And there in itself creates new opportunities where access to that, that, that data um, is done through consent-based management and enables fintechs to then build account aggregation uh, products, um, helps them to provide better financial management tools, all the things that ultimately enrich the, the lives of, of, of consumers. And we, we fully understand that it's the customer's data, it's not ours. A lot of banks have had the mentality of kind of closed data silos um, and they, they they flout um, puppy uh, legislation and regulation as to why they should and should not share it. At the end of the day, it's not, it's not the bank's data, it's the customer's data. All that we need to do is fulfill our role and make sure that we can share it in the most safe and convenient way for our clients. Thanks, Joe. 
No, I, I just want to <laughs> add on to that because I think it's, it's extremely valuable. And, and uh, there's another quote where they say payments is a contact sport, right? <laughs> it is very volatile. It's, it's messy. It's clunky. But I think partnership is the cornerstone of innovation. And we're trying to, we also as, as the operator and pay shop, we're really trying hard to figure out until the Kofi bill gets announced and what, we, what the way forward is, is how do we separate the non-financial from the financial? How do we make sure we focus on the core skills and, and the customers that our fintechs own most of the time? How do we make sure we unlock them and enable them to be part of pay shop? Because the same way they want to be part of this, we want them to be part of this as well. And I think if we can get that right and we can get the fintechs to, you know, utilize PayShop through their, their banks and we keep the core of the financial, the national payment system um, safe and secure, but also then utilizing the, the, the core skills and the, the benefit that the fintechs bring from acquisition point of view, I think that when that day happens and realizes, I'll be a very happy Colin. Thanks, Colin. Look, we're in the partnerships team, so we understand the importance of it. Um, but I completely agree. Partnerships and collaboration is definitely very important to you know, bring about accessibility, grow the economy, and fulfill that greater objective that we're all looking to fulfill. Um, I think I'm going to end this here because I'm very aware that we're the panel before lunch, and there might be some questions. So we're just going to open up to, oh, there's already, I mean, I couldn't even finish speaking. Getting in my steps for today. Can you stand or? No, you stand. I can stand, probably. Introduce yourself. Um, Colin, I laughed when you said, uh, yeah, don't try and run fintechs inside banks or big corporates. Um, hi, I'm Derek. I work at Snapscan, part of Standard Bank. <laughs> so I've been testing that theory, theory for five years uh, plus. We're probably the oldest 24-year-olds in the room. Yeah, I'll stick you for a beer and we can chat about the good days. Um, I've got a question around PayShap in general, and it's more around, uh, like a lot of things, the rails and everything are great. It, I think the devil's in the detail around, let's call it the business incentives around how the rail operates. And it's a, it's a paradox or conundrum I've been trying to get wrap my head around the day it ever launched. And I th the thing that triggered for me was when it went live was the concept of it's a pay it pays model as opposed to traditional acquiring where the merchant's the one paying the fee and the consumer pays nothing to make a payment. And obviously as a peer-to-peer -peer payment rail, it makes sense because as an EFT rail, that's usually what you would pay for an RTC fee. Um, but then obviously when it gets to a consumer to a business payment, the thing becomes a bit lopsided and it's a bit messy. Um, now I get that the, the, the big idea around it is to displace cash. And obviously a portion of that cash, those cash transactions are peer-to-peer -peer payments and it makes complete sense there. But I'm curious to hear from you, what, firstly, what was the kind of thinking around starting at the pay payers model? Because my sense is, I think the guys who were the loudest in the room at the time were the, were the guys who were looking after their real-time clearing uh, revenue line items and feeling threatened that um, PayShap would threaten that the most at this stage. But then also, if that is the case, and it's, it's a use case for peer-to-peer, -peer, and then this transition, as you mentioned in the roadmap, where you guys want to get to from a consumer to business payment perspective, are there any ambitions around flipping the model around? Or is it going to be a case of the market now somehow needs to adapt? Because I look at things like Capitec Pay, for instance, and I, I think Jerome's is very comfortably knowing that the PayShap commercial model in its current state is not really a threat um, if you're doing consumer to business payments at this stage. And it's going to take quite some time for it to actually become a true consumer to business um, open banking, let's call it challenger to traditional rails. Sorry, I got, you, I got the gist of it. Um, yeah, we're also very happy with PayShop. Thanks for the question. <laughs> no, so no, it's a great question and, and thank you for asking it because I think it's top of mind for everyone. And uh, I mean, what, what we, obviously the reason why we went with peer-to-peer -peer is because it's the most simplest form of it. So we can just test some of the use cases that we have around PayShop. It was very conceptual and, you know, it looks great on PowerPoint, but actually implementing it, you know, we, we've been down this road too many times before. Um, actually, you know, when you've actually deployed it and implemented, what does it do? Is it actually how we've envisioned it? And then, you know, fail fast. How do we quickly adapt and learn and then make sure we're achieving the right use cases? 
So from a person to business perspective, I mean, we, uh, we're working very closely with the regulator and with some of our um, retailers as well and understanding how do we commercialize this, right? Because if you think about a merchant pays model, you know, if you flip it around, how do we then challenge the, um, the current construct of, of interchange? Do we flip it around that it is something that happens from the initiating bank um, in the request to pay model? Um, is the cost transferred to the merchant so it goes to zero cost on the, on the customer side so we achieve that goal, but then what is the implication to the merchant? Is there enough margin in there for the banks to make sure that there's enough revenue to split at, down, downstream because there's a lot of value players in there? Or is it a split model so we don't um, erode any of the, the issuing um, uh, revenue that you also make? So it's all these things that we're thinking about and it's commercial cases that we would need to build from a person to business perspective. And how do we identify? I think that's the critical thing. Technically, how do we identify that this is a person to business, this is a person to person, this is a person, and, and also the different types of merchants. Is it a, I say merchant, sorry, I come from a card background, but business, you know, is it a small? Because if you now bring that into an ecosystem in the township economies, you know, now there's a cost involved, will they then rather just default back to cash then? And it's these things we need to be very careful about and how do we implement them and how do we work closely with our banks, our retailers, and the right people in the ecosystem so we don't go and botch this. I mean, it's, it's very easy to copy and paste, but then why? What's the purpose? You know, we really need to think about this and challenge ourselves and see what will be the bright model and for the right use case. I hope that answers your question. Sorry. I'll add to that quickly. Thank you, guys. Um, oh, go so, for it. I also just want to close off on trust. You know, so I think it was safer to be able to also start with a smaller base. To your, to your point, um, and I think for Standard Bank specifically, that's why our next our MVP was to then start looking at corporates in terms of being able to really increase that. Um, that volume of customers and also start changing the behavior. But having started that, I think, incrementally in the, in, in, in the approach. But having to also explore, and I, and I stress again, uh, without getting onto the fraud pulpit, the heavy lifting that we are needing to do right now. I mean, we've had to spend, I think, an, an additional six months that we hadn't planned for responding to the fact of requirements, etc. So those things, had we opened up very quickly, would have put us in a very precarious environment. So I do think having started with the peer-to-peer -peer was the most responsible thing to do to really set up uh, PayShop for success in the future.